So salad, it's healthy, right? So during my school, I noticed that there was an increased recalls and public health warnings on lettuce, bagged lettuce, kale, coleslaw mix, and other produce. And listeria was popping up more and more. So I wondered, is it a possibility that listeria and produce was increasing? So I contacted Lori McIntyre at BC to CDC, and she provided me with this paper from Macquarie from 2009. The purpose of Macquarie's paper was to confirm that biologic hazards are still the primary source of food recalls. Her findings did show that biological hazards are the primary source of food recalls, and despite stronger guidelines and regulations, foodborne pathogens were still finding their way into food products. So I compiled a table summarizing Macquarie's the findings. So, in 2006, there was a total of 164 food recalls. 22 of them were due to listeria, 16 due to salmonella, and 17 due to E. coli. In 2007, total recalls jumped up to 347, with listeria increasing to 33, salmonella to 46, and E. coli to 30. By 2008, recalls again jumped to 431, listeria jumped up to 74, Salmonella, 31, and E. coli dropped down to 18. A notable recall that happened in 2008 was the maple leaf product, meat products that were recalled due to listeria. So at the findings of our paper, it showed that there was a total of 942 recalls during the years of 2006 and 2008. 287 of them were due to listeria, salmonella, and E. coli alone. The top pathogen responsible for food recalls during that time was salmonella, followed by listeria. The other 655 recalls were due to chemicals, such as melamine and pesticides, heavy metals such as lead, mercury, arsenic, and aluminum, for a matter such as glass, metal, plastic. Other reasons were listed, such as choking hazard, flu-like illness. And some other pathogens there were Sigella, Bacteriaceus, Staphylococcus aureus, and some C. botulinum. So for me, I followed the, basically the same methods that Macquarie did. I collected food data recall data from the CFIA, FDA, Health Canada, and FSIS websites from 2016 to 2018. I then compared those results to Macquarie's study done in 2006-2008, and I decided for each pathogen to separate them into four categories, meat, dairy, produce, and other. So here's my results from 2006-2018. In 2016, there was 864 food recalls, 170 of them were due to listeria, 82 were salmonella, 43 were E. coli. In 2017, there was a drop to 690 total recalls, listeria dropped down to 111, salmonella dropped all the way down to 27, and so did E. coli, it dropped to 35. By 2018, again, there was a drop in food recalls to 558. 78 re recalls of listeria, 94 in salmonella, and 31 E. coli. Notable recalls that occurred in 2018 for salmonella was the recall of frozen breaded chicken products. <laughs> so I decided to put a graph to compare my research results to Macquarie's. As you can see, Macquarie's 2006 to 2008 is a steady increase in recalls. When you go by 2016, there's a major increase of recalls. But it is showing a steady decline, which is good. Also noted on this graph is that most recalls occur in the summer and spring. So now I'm going to go over each of the pathogens, separating them into four categories, produce, meat, cheese, and other. So starting with listeria, in 2006 to 2008, the majority of listeria recalls happened in meat and meat products, with very little in produce. Come 2016 to 2018, Listeria recalls increased in the other category, which includes notable products like granola bars, protein bars, hummus, trail mix, pancakes, and sunflower kernels. And as you can see, produce jumped up from 13 to 85 by 2018. For salmonella in 2006 to 2008, primary recalls for salmonella were actually in the other category, including like stuff like tea, pistachios, potato chips sesame seeds, macadamia nuts, nut butter, and coconut. By 2016, again, the other category, main strong for salmonella. 
There was an increase in produce, but there was also an increase in meat and meat products, which had a lot to do with the frozen breaded chicken products. For E. coli, for both, year, both three year periods, the main source of E. coli recalls was actually meat and meat products. In 2016 to 2018, there was an increase in the other category for E. coli, which included flour, pie shells, tart shells, macadamia nuts, pancake mix, and cake mix. And if you notice a trend with the other category, these pathogens are starting to find their way into drier products with low water activity. So the conclusions of my paper shows that between 2016 and 2018, recalls were 45% higher than recalls in 2006 and 2008. There was a total of 2,112 recalls during the period, three-year period. 671 of them were due to listeria, salmonella, and E. coli. And the top pathogen responsible in this period was listeria, followed by salmonella. So the conclusions, um, other ones we can go over, the 100 and, sorry, 1,441 recalls. There's a new category that was not included in the McCory's paper, and that was allergens. So for allergens, there was undeclared egg, milk, wheat, nuts. For matter contamination, such as plastic, metal, insects, and rubber. Other spoilage and poor quality. And some other pathogens to note was hepatitis A, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Cyclospora. So my conclusion showed that there is an increase in both food recalls and listeria recalls. This could be due to several factors. First, listeria monitoring has increased since the maple leaf outbreak, as well as technology has improved, so we we're able to track the pathogens more easier. There's also an increased amount of food products on the market. More food on the market, more chances to find recalls. And there is also a possibility within the research that increase in competition and customer demand and mass production, there might be less focus on sanitation and more focus on production. So for the public health rationale, listeria mortality rate is about 20 to 30 percent worldwide. Pathogens such as listeria are becoming more predominant in produce, and pathogens could be adapting to current food processes. So I have one example, a paper done by Litch, Tax, and Hedberg in 2009, as well as Chinoy, Oliver, and Deering in 2017. The pathogens such as Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella can actually, are growing in the soil and can actually contaminate the plant itself and grow within the seeds, roots, epidermis, and vascular tissues. With this happening, washing produce will not be enough to remove pathogens from the food product. So that way we have to basically look at new methods at the farm level to help prevent this from happening. So at the conclusion of my study, the knowledge transition I hope to achieve, is that we can create one national recall database. In my research, it was tons of different recall sites I was analyzing to get all the data, and I can see how it might be confusing for the public just to go here and there to get all the data. It'd be nice to focus it all on one website. The CIFA website, I must say, is actually very well done. I actually like using <laughs> going through that one. BCCC can also use my research to help maybe identify a new project, product and pathogen association. And industry may have to look for new ways to control listeria in the food processing environment, especially if food the pathogens are actually getting within the fruits and vegetables themselves. So in conclusion, listeria recalls have increased, same with the recalls in um, salmonella, as well as total recalls in general have increased. So hopefully these, my research can help conduct new other research to help prevent and reduce food recalls in the future. Is there any questions? Also, I'd like to give a special thanks to Lauren Murray McIntyre at BC City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, next uh, we have Michael. Thank you, Tina, for the introduction. Thank you, Tina. And I want to thank NCCH for the opportunity to present my research project today. And I will be talking about my findings on levels of food safety and cannabis edible safety knowledge in BC populations. So I will start off with a brief overview of cannabis edibles in Canada. Then I will discuss what I found in 
the literature and state the purpose of my study. I will then describe the method and results. Lastly, I will talk about the public health, uh, public health significance of my findings. So an edible is any food product that contains cannabinoids, which are the active ingredients in cannabis. And they can be in the form of a baked good, candy, infused oil and butters, or even a tincture. And the variety of product is expanding. And there are over 100 known cannabinoids, but the two major ones on the market are te tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, or, and cannabidiol, or CBD. And THC is psychoactive, meaning that it can make you high, uh, whereas CBD cannot. So because only THC is psychoactive, uh, there's upcoming legislation that will be in effect, in effect for additional cannabis products, and that will limit the dose of THC to 10 milligrams per package. And it will also include a standardized symbol for THC-containing products, child-proof packaging, health warnings, reading list, and nutrition fact table. And this new legislation will come into effect by October 17, 2019, and, but we'll likely not going to see edibles on the market until mid-December. So I personally agree with this conservative approach from the government because in my literature review, I found that 46% of Canadians wanted to try an edible product after the legalization. So we're likely going to see a surge of edible usage, but only less than 20% of these people, of Canadians feel knowledgeable enough to cook with cannabis. And in the past survey, it showed that younger populations have, the lo have lower food safety knowledge than other age groups, and these, this population is also the ones that use cannabis the most. I also looked at uh, how the edible legalization panned out in the U.S., and in the beginning, they had more ER visits because children were accidentally ingesting uh, cannabis-infused products, such as candies. And there were also a lack of authority over cannabis by the public health department over there because many governments didn't consider edibles as food products. And that created some loopholes where edibles producers didn't need to uh, get inspected for food safety aspects. So based on that, I think there is a potential for edible-induced illnesses for edible users. And that can come in the form of an overdose symptom, uh, also known as a green out. And that is when you ingest a dose of 50 to 100 milligrams of THC. Uh, it can result in rapid heart rate, nausea, pain, uh, and even hallucinations. Uh, but there is no scientific evidence to show that it can be lethal. However, it is more potent than, cons than uh, smoking cannabis. And in addition, uh, edibles have an additional layer of concern with foodborne illnesses because before it is an edible, it is also a food product. And cannabis is just an ingredient. And without enough education and regulation for it, edibles can become contaminated with different pathogens and the highest concern with it is the infused oils and butters, which can be used to make various forms of edibles. And it can be contaminated with Clostridium botulinum toxins. Uh, so, and so knowing these information will help consumers reduce health risks caused by edibles. So my study, I wanted to determine if consumers in BC have enough knowledge to make these safe choices when it comes to edible consumption and preparation in both the food safety aspect and also the edible safety aspect. And so I compared uh, these two knowledges in uh, different types of populations, uh, namely current users and non-users. So I made an online self-administered survey using SurveyMonkey and this distributed it through Reddit, which is an online forum. My target population was BC residents that were of legal age to consume edibles. So I only allowed these people to complete the survey. 
I also ask their age, gender, education level, the type of cannabis product they have used, frequency, and purpose of use. And also, I ask if they work in the related industries uh, or in public health. So then I give them a short quiz on food safety and edible safety with six questions each. Uh, some of these are edible, multiple choice questions and some are true and false. And they were all fundamental. Uh, for example, for the food safety portion, I asked them, uh, is handling uh, raw meat and ready to eat vegetables on the same cutting board an example of cross-contamination? And for the cannabis edible safety portion, I asked them, like, uh, it can take up to two hours after consuming an edible product to, for the user to feel the effects. Is that true or false? So in total, I surveyed 198 people, uh, which I then calculated the mean test scores for each variable group. For example, for, uh, in the, as you can see in the table here, for gender, I divide them into males, females, and others. And for age, I had different age groups. So I compared the mean using ANOVA separately for both the food safety and edible safety tests. And I also did a correlation between the two set of test scores. So the first significant result I found was that cannabis edible users have higher knowledge in edible safety than cannabis non-users. And this excludes a group that only smoked or used non-edible cannabis, which this group did not see any significant difference uh, from the other two groups. They lie somewhere in between. And secondly, the purpose of edible user usage did not affect the knowledge of edible safety, since both recreational and medicinal users had higher knowledge than the non-users. And thirdly, frequency also did not seem to affect edible safety knowledge. Uh, any amount of usage had higher uh, knowledge, knowledge scores than the non-users. So I did also find a positive correlation of 0.18 between food safety and edible safety knowledge. So in summary, people who consume edibles for any purpose or frequency had higher knowledge in edible safety than non-users. And people who have high food safety knowledge tend to also have high edible safety knowledge and vice versa. So for discussion, why was there no significant difference between any of the groups in food safety knowledge? Uh, well, it could be because everyone is exposed to some sort of food safety education in the past. For example, in high school, we had home economic classes that taught us basic uh, food safety. But this is not the case for edibles. And what do the significant difference in edible safety knowledge actually mean? Well, it could mean that people did their research be before consuming an edible, or that they had a bad experience with it, and then it led them to it led them to doing more research that way. And if that is the case, then public health intervention should be in the first should be in place be to prevent that from happening in the first place, because uh, some of the adverse effects caused by edibles are irreversible. So in terms of public health significance, statistical evidence from this project can help develop health promotion and monitoring programs to educate public health professionals and in turn educate the public and operators who sell and produce edibles. For example, we can incorporate edibles into the current food safe certification program. And the results can also stimulate policymakers to develop new or amend old legislations, and jurisdictions uh, can be given to professionals such as the environmental health officers to regulate edible premises. And ultimately, we want to prevent illnesses uh, related, to, related to consuming edibles. So here is a prom health promotion project that I was personally involved in where we developed an edible premises inspection checklist 
and education plan for environmental health officers. So this tool will allow, uh, will allow them to go into a food establishment that produces or sells edibles and find health hazards related to edibles and also in addition to the general food safety aspects. So for future projects, it, my survey can be expanded to understand public perception of the risks risk of each specific edible product. Uh, we can also survey the public on their perception of the new regulation when it comes into effect. And also we can focus on assessing the knowledge of specific pop, uh, populations, uh, for example, uh, environmental health officers or restaurant operators. So for limitations, because this was a student project that I, I did in the middle of a full course load, I had limited time and resources. So uh, I would have liked to ask more questions in my survey and also uh, increase the sample population so I get a more representative data. And uh, so also because of the nature of this online self-administered survey, um, I couldn't control the respondents. So if they really want to fake their answers, they can. So it, it could be, it, it is prone to survey fraud. So all of this contribute to a larger margin of error and or less confidence. So these are the things to keep in mind in my future projects. And lastly, I want to acknowledge Helen Hickok, who's here with us today, for providing guidance throughout the entire project, and also Lorraine and Al from BCCBC for giving me the inspiration. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for uh, being here, everybody, to listen to our presentations today. So I am Diane Lee, and today I am going to talk about my research, which was on evaluation of BC Food Bank Guidelines usefulness. So um, I would like to ask uh, two <laughs> true or false questions here. So the first statement, food banks can accept food products past their best before date. True or false? True? Yes, it is true. <laughs> so best before date is more about the food quality than the safety, right? And second statement, food banks may be able to accept leftover hot ready to eat foods from buffet, which were exposed and offered to public. What do you think? It's it's false, yes. So once it was exposed to public, the risk is just too high, so it's not recommended. All right, so uh, today my presentation will cover the purpose, and I want to give you a little bit of background information, and I'll talk about methods, resolve discussion, and I'll conclude with a knowledge translation. The purpose of my research was to evaluate the usefulness of the guidelines for food distribution organizations with grocery or meal programs for food bank operators. So I would like to define the, the term food distribution organizations first. I'm going to call it FDOs from now on. So it's like an umbrella term that would include organizations such as food banks, uh, soup kitchen, community kitchen. Um, so it's the organizations that would receive, store, process, or distribute food products in purpose to relieve of food insecurity. So why is my research important? <laughs> it's because um, food banks are getting more and more important, and there are health risks associated with them and uh, we need to mediate the risk. 
Why are the food banks important? Because food insecurity is becoming a serious problem in Canada. So according to Food Banks Canada um, report in 2016, 8.3 percentage of Canadian households are suffering from food insecurity. So there is um, high use of food banks in BC. So there are 424 food banks and meal programs here. And 103,464 people are supported. And large proportion of them, 65% actually, they are prolonged long-term users. So um, it used to be that if you look at the photo there, um, those are the products that the food bank clients would get usually. So if they are relying heavily on the donation, then they are more prone to malnutrition and they're more likely to develop diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, or hypertension. So uh, these days, it's more encouraged for them to uh, donate healthier food options, which could include fresh vegetables, fruits, or high-protein products like eggs, soy products, or meats. But we all know that if not handled properly, they're more likely to cause foodborne disease for clients. So how are these risks mediated? Well, if there's any kind of public health hazard, then Public Health Act comes in. And we have food premises regulation also. But by definition, food banks are not supposed to process the food. So they're technically exempted from food premises regulation. So they do not have to go through inspections or they do not have to get the food safe training. So in attempt to um, provide them with the useful tool, BC CDC have published a guideline called the Guidelines for Food Distribution Organizations with Grocery or Meal Programs in 2016. It has been accessible through the website, so anybody could have searched them and download them and use them. Uh, so that's the cover page of the guideline. And it's a very comprehensive guideline. So this is the table of content. And as you can see, that uh, it's over 50 pages long. And there are mul multiple parts to it. So it gives them very practical advice on how to run things smoothly, how to build relationship uh, with the clients and among internal staff. And they also give them useful information about food safe aspects. So I had three research questions. First one was that is the guideline being used by food bank operators or managers in DC? Second was, does the guideline meet their needs? And thirdly, is the guideline sufficient to educate them on essential information? So to answer these questions, I created survey questionnaire with three parts to it. The first, I have asked them uh, demographic questions. So where do they work? How long have they been working there? And what are the commonly encountered issues at food banks? This was to um, see what kind of area that the guideline could focus more on. And thirdly, I did a little food safe knowledge level test. So yes. <laughs> and I wanted to uh, do a statistical analysis to find any kind of association between their knowledge level and the guideline use. So I did a chi-square test to find if there is any association between their knowledge level and the period of guideline use. And then secondly, I also did the chi-square test uh, to see if there is any statistically significant association between the knowledge level and the period of work in the field. There were 12 questions, and uh, based on the score they got, I have divided them into three categories, low, medium, or high level. 
And the p-value I got for these tests were actually very quite high, <laughs> um, which was surprising because I thought that since the guideline contains um, lots of information about food safe, um, if they have been using them, then I thought that they would they may get the higher score. But this could be due to the fact that I have a limited sample size. So I, I received the 30 responses back, which is limited. And the result I had, majority of the people, more than half of them were in that medium level. So that could have skewed the result. And this is the I mean, <laughs> summary result I got. So the question was, what type of FDO do you work in? And majority of the respondents uh, stated they, they work in food banks. Some of them, they also worked in community kitchen, meal programs, community enterprise, etc. And a majority, I mean about 50% of the uh, respondents, they had more than five years of experience as an operator or managers of FDOs. This is a very important chart. So the question I asked was, how long have you been using the guidelines? And about a little less than 50% of them said that they were not aware of the guidelines. And one person said that uh, the person chose not to use the guideline because of the length. And about 50% of them have been using the guideline. So this is also important because this is the question I asked to the current guideline users. And 80% of them either agreed or strongly agreed on the guidelines usefulness. And no one disagreed or strongly disagreed. So there is a definite need to promote this wider use because so many of the users think that it's really useful. Um, this is, uh, <clears throat> it looks complicated, but let's now for now focus on the gray boxes. So it, it's um, indicating the issues that the food bank operators encounter always. So you can see that this box here has the most gray area. That means assessing each food items for safety is a commonly, like the issue that they would encounter always. This is important because it's a very important step that they need to go through to make sure the items are safe for the consumers. But the guideline, um, if you look through it, there is a very useful tools in there. There's a decision-making trees, uh, flow charts. It's like single pages, so you could, they could possibly um, have that on the wall because they're relying heavily on their volunteers or they're short on staff. So it's difficult for them to make those decisions with the given time. So if they have tools like that, it's possible that they would be able to make those decisions in a more timely manner. And here, um, these, are, these two were the least commonly encountered issues. Uh, one was another FDOs taking their donations from their donors, and the other one was the poor condition of donated food. So uh, results from the study could be translated to uh, revise the guideline. Um, one of the comments was that they would like to see more single page, um, more highlighted um, pages in the guideline. So possibly the comment could be used in the future in BCCDC. And um, we could use this data to promote its wider use. So I would like to thank uh, Lauren McIntyre from BCCDC and Helen Haycock and BCIT for all the support and um, this guidance. Thank you so much. Okay, that be all. Thank you, Christine, Michael, and Diane. Uh, so we'll go to questions in the room first. Do you have any questions from for any of the students? Sure, go ahead. Um, so 
with regard to the Syria. Sorry, I just. Oh, so ask. first of all, very nice. <laughs> said that the mortality is in the 30% range. And I don't know if this is true, but when I speak to Linda Wang and ask her what the positivity rate of stool samples from the woman would be, so that 10% of stool samples contain listeria. So that to me implies that there's a lot of listeria around and that that mortality represents some very large concentration or intensive exposure in all of the other points you brought up are pertinent to trying to figure that out. So it's just a comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, great work. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, for Christine first, I wonder about the validity of the comparisons over time because did both of the comparisons include FDA? And I'm, I'm not sure why you would have FDA as a source of recalls for Canada. Oh, no, I did Canada and the States together. Well, in both cases? Yes, in both cases, so yes. Both cases. both cases, I fall basically did that same kind of style. Yeah, I used both American and Canadian because the Canadian didn't have a lot of recalls, so I thought my data would be stronger if I used both American and Canadian. Could you separate them out, Canada versus I could have. That's something I could have done, but just for the purpose of my paper, I just picked down a few select things because I could have, like, the Quarry study did separate it out, right. but I didn't have the time, so I just focused on my main questions. Yeah. And, and in terms of the, the uh, uh, produce, which is really very interesting, uh, do you have a notion of how much of that has to do with bagged produce? Because that's so much more easy to identify. Uh, and to test for as compared to open produce? It was a basic combination of both. Um, I didn't, I, 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 I could demonstrate paper with me, but uh, basically I include both bagged fresh produce and all that. So I guess the bagged produce was probably a little less than the actual fresh. Okay, because when I was a lab, there weren't no bagged produce. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So maybe that's one of the things that's changing mm -hmm. that could be leading to this difference as well. And and have you an idea of how many of those recalls were associated with illness? Uh, no, I didn't do that. I put that as something that should be done for future research because, again, I just focused on a certain part. But Macquarie's study also suggested that we correlate the illness with the food recalls okay. to see if there's a trend. Okay. And just a slight comment, uh, yeah. you might present aggregate figures over the three years because you expect a lot of variability from year to year and just looking at a three-year block 10 years ago versus now is probably of greater interest than looking at the within-year comparisons. Yes. Thank you. Just a question and a, and a friendly comment on the, the food bank uh -huh. study. So when you're looking at these predictors of knowledge on the part of the, mm -hmm. of the operators, you mentioned that you had broken the scores down into sort of a low, medium, and high. Score. Did you have a scale of uh, like a, uh, just a raw score that was uh, available too? Uh, yes. So there were 12 questions I asked. Right. Uh, there were multiple choice. Some were multiple choice. Some were true or false questions. So um, I have divided up to um, the f zero to four. The yep. score was the low. And then the next was medium and then high. Right. The, re the reason I ask is just because with the small sample size, and you did see this trend um, in you know, the association between duration in the business and the score, so the 0.23 is the mm -hmm. p-value. I suggest it might be interesting to just look at the a statistical test just using the, num the raw score rather than those categories to right. increase your statistical power mm -hmm. to detect the difference. might be worth doing because yeah. there does seem to be something there. Mm -hmm. So really interesting study overall. Just a small comment on uh, another thing you might do. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking on these projects. And, and uh, I had questions around the food bank guidelines. So, you know, the fact that most people haven't seen it, I just want to uh, <laughs> what, what suggestions do you have for me around health promotion? Like, how do I, because uh, Laura Lansing was, uh, helped develop the survey. She's the director of BC Food Banks. How do we get the word out? How do we get them to read it? And most of those one-pagers on evaluating boxed foods and frozen foods, 
they're all on our web website as one pagers. Um, I just, I'd like to. Your, I thought your survey was really great, and it's emailable, and I would love to like send it across Canada. But how do I? How do we do that? How do we improve this? How do we do health promotion? Because we're not very good at it at BCCDC, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so that's that's really really difficult because it would be great if you can print out the physical copy, and then because. Um, but it's it's really it's not very practical to do that I guess right. So from our conversation, uh, the guideline is available at the website. Um, has it been uh, emailed out to the operators to Food Bank BC or Food Bank Canada? Um, I have sent it to Food Bank BC, mm -hmm. and I have an arrangement that. Next year at the Food Bank BC conference, we're going to print a bunch of the revised copies. Oh, that's great! And and give them to their uh, conference. Okay. But I, I don't know how we get to the smaller people unless we can figure out who they are, get their address, and mail them copies. Right. But um, I think it's it's great that uh, so um, I just forgot what I was going to say. Okay. Um, so I think it's it's. Uh, important to um, okay. Let me just organize my thought here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it could be the one of the uh, medium would be to go to those maybe events or conferences that they are there, and if like word of mouth, if they are starting to use them, then they could tell the other food. Bank operators also, um, yeah. And um, I was gonna say that um, I had a difficult time collecting enough responses, but after I um, do the Food Bank BC newsletter, uh, when the, the link for the survey was sent, I collected immediately more responses. That means that those newsletters, the email newsletters, are use really useful in reaching out to the operators. Good. So okay. I thought that if we can reach out to Food Bank Canada, that they would have a wider network, then that would be another effective way to reach out to them. So if the newsletter is effective, are you thinking about maybe doing the synopsis of your project and representing it to the link to the webpage? <laughs> <laughs> that is actually a great idea. That I think definitely we should go for it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder also what would be the cost of the conference. Mm. Yeah, the last conference, um, the last conference they had, I requested that we print out copies, but my ops manager said we didn't have the budget and I couldn't do it. So next year's conference, I've got a promise from the current ops manager that they can find money in the budget. But by next year, who knows what will happen. <laughs> Frustrating. One, que one question would relate to you're asking questions about whether they know what's in the guidelines. So what is the practice that's yeah. taking place? Mm -hmm. Which is probably a more important question. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. do that? Well, one of the things that I notice is assessing food for safety every time. One of the biggest issues I know at the Vancouver Food Bank, even with the canned food, is they, they can't just accept a can or a box of food. They have to check the CFI recall site on every single wow. food item that comes through their door. It's an enormous time resource for their volunteers. Unfortunately, they have a lot of them. But, I, you know, um, I don't know how to speed that up. But but that that was a very good and then and then um, your project. <laughs> so I think it's product, really each product has a barcode and you might be able to create. Yeah. The the barcode is the UPC symbol that tells the store how much money to charge. It's not that useful. It usually has more than more than that. Not 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 so much. You can't use barcodes for recalls. Uh, the barcode is not useful for recalls. It's not going to tell you the lot or the right. date manufactured. Um, and then I just uh, uh, your your project with recalls and how they change over time. I, I think it's interesting the food commodities changing mm -hmm. and flour is a, is a big issue. I think we're going to see a lot more 
flower outbreaks and and so uh, even though they're E. coli, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing salmonella because we see salmonella in spices. Mm -hmm. and well, that's what I noticed in the other categories. A lot of the drier products were starting to get hit yeah. by them. That's I'm thinking that they're starting to adapt and find other ways. You have to be careful with all of that because the technology has yeah. so changed in the last decade mm -hmm. that you begin to see things that you had no capacity to see mm -hmm. before. So you're you're making the assumption that the flower now is worse than it was. It may not be. It's just we now have tools that can say, oh, here's the source attribution for this outbreak. Yeah, it's an interesting point because there's the ascertainment of better testing and then also potentially the detection of more outbreaks, I think, through uh, you know, just the changes in public health practice, including the, you know, the expansion of a lot of online tools and the ability to d detect cases that might not have been noted to be related previously. So there's yeah there's more outbreaks, but the uh, the causes for that change are potentially myriad. It would be interesting to know how many recalled food items they find from this lookup, because maybe it's a waste of time. From from that the lookup in, in the food bank. Oh 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 oh. Uh, well, they do they do find sometimes boxes of food that get set aside uh, at the processor level uh, that are they were recalled. Yeah, that are meant to go to the garbage that yeah. end up at the at the food bank. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Or the production date. Well at least you pull up at least you pull up the product. And then you look for the lot numbers. Yeah. Most cans, if you look at cans, the best before date is stamped on either the top or the bottom of the can. It's not at all related to the UPC yeah. yet. But the UPC could find you the product, and then you can search you can do that the secondarily. So they can scan the product, and they could then look. It, it has to work. <laughs> can I ask about your edibles? Uh, separating out people's knowledge of microbiologic versus uh, sort of chemical hazards. Do you have a way to do that? Um, you have sort of an overview on your questions, but uh, what are people concerned about and what do they know about? Well, mainly is the microbiologic portion right. that people are more concerned about. And I know there is a, a certain chemical hazard that's related on, that's more on the farm side. Farm that, level. By, 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 I meant pharmacological by chemical uh, in terms of the amount oh, of oh, yeah, so that, so when I ask the question for food safety is on the biological or like factors of food and also oh, for the edible side it's just based on oh, strictly on edibles and how the drug works. Right. And so that's how I distinguish the the two. But is, do, you, do you think that people's knowledge of the uh, of the dosing is sufficient that they can protect themselves? So one of the questions. Who knows enough? One of the questions I asked was how much do you think the standard dose is, okay. and most people actually can answer that correctly to 10 milligrams. Yeah. So one of the one of the questions that they didn't get, most people didn't get, was. Uh, what is the risk of, like which type of can, cannabis mm -hmm. edible has the highest risk? Right. And that's the infused oils and butters, and people did not know which one has the more risk. Okay, any other questions? Uh, we didn't have any questions from online audiences, so that concludes our webinar, or our seminar. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.